Hafa day and greetings from Guam. Um, my name is Julian. Again, um, I am so honored that you've asked me to read a section of my essay entitled To Hell with Drowning for your amazing conference. I wish so badly to be there. Unfortunately, I can't make it, but um, hopefully this will do for now. I'll just read a section um, of, the, of the essay, if that's all right. This piece is called, oh, you can edit that out. It's hell drown. Okay. <clears throat> I know nothing of the night sky. This saddens but does not surprise Larry Rigatal, a master navigator who is chewing betel nut beneath a canopy of stars. He is from Lamatrek, an outer island of Yap in the Federated States of Micronesia. But we are meeting in a canoe house on the neighboring island of Guam, where I call home. As we speak, Raigatal is using his hands to split the horizon into a 32-point star compass. He is drawing on centuries of knowledge to explain to me the art of wayfinding, a method of non-instrument navigation that has been used by his people for thousands of years to voyage between the many atolls and islands of Micronesia. To my surprise, the compass he is conceptually grafting onto the sky is more than a map of stars as they rise and fall from east to west across the horizon. Wayfinding is a manner of organizing an elaborate body of directional information collected and committed to memory by countless navigators before him and passed down through chance to his grandfather, to his father, to him. It's a living repository of spectacularly specific details about sea swells, wind currents, reefs, shoals, and other sea marks, including living ones, a pod of pilot whales, a shark with special markings, a seabird. As a Pacific Islander, I knew that the canoe house has long been a place of learning, and I'd come to ask Raikatal whether wayfinding had been compromised by climate change. As a human rights lawyer working at the intersection of indigenous rights and environmental justice, I'd also come because I believe that the peoples of the Pacific have important intellectual contributions to make to the global climate justice movement. We have insights born not only of living in close harmony with the earth, but also of having survived so much already. The ravages of extractive industry, the experiments of nuclear powers, we have information vital to the project of recovering the planet's life support systems. Finally, I'd come because my personal and professional reserves were depleted. Like so many others working in the climate space, I'd been feeling overwhelmed since August when the IPCC released part of its sixth assessment report. The conclusions were bleak. Reading the report felt like being buried alive by an avalanche of facts the facts of sea level rise and progressively severe storms, among others, and I was looking to claw my way out. As the darkness deepened around me and Ragatol, I realized two things. First, the climate justice must listen more carefully to those most vulnerable to the ravages of climate change, such as Oceania's frontline communities. Second, we who are waist deep in that movement need more than facts to win. We need stories, and not just stories about the stakes, which we know are high, but stories about the places we call home, stories about our own small corners of the earth as we know them, as we love them. Perhaps the story of climate change is a story of flowers. These are the facts in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the country where the U.S. military houses its Ronald Reagan ballistic missile defense test site. There, a crucial study on sea level rise found that coral atoll nations may not be able to sustain a human population past the present decade. This conclusion was met with trepidation by the Marshallese people I spoke with, who hear the ticking of the climate clock louder than most. The study, led by the U.S. Geological Survey and commissioned by the Pentagon, focused exclusively on an island in the Kwajalein Atoll that supports some 1,250 American military personnel, contractors, and civilians living there and on nearby islands. For the most part, the U.S. otherwise ignores this region. Wake Island, and I, where an additional study on sea level rise is now being done, is proof of that fact. 
wake, an island with no permanent inhabitants that the U.S. considers an unincorporated territory, is run by the Air Force under the authority of a caretaker permit issued by the Interior Department. For its part, the RMI not only has a competing vision of what caretaking looks like, it also has a competing claim to wake. In April 2016, the RMI formally claimed wake when it filed its maritime coordinates with the UN Secretary General. The truth is that neither government is entirely correct. The strongest claim is that of the Marshallese people themselves who say the island is theirs by way of history, culture, and birthright, and who long to be able to take proper care of it. They also say that wake is not the island's true name. Its true name is Enenkio, the island of the orange flower. Famous in lore for the beauty of these flowers, Enenkio is also known for its rare assemblage of nesting seabirds, frigates and albatross among others. Legend has it that local warriors seeking to prove their worthiness would journey to the island in search of the wing bones of one such seabird. 14 years ago on another starry night, a high chief explained to me that the retrieved bones were used as chisels in traditional tattoo ceremonies. I did not grasp the significance of the strip of orange splayed across the RMI flag until much later. Former President Hilda Heine would tell her poet daughter, Kathy, who would tell me, for the Marshallese, orange is the color of bravery. On my island, climate change is a story of storms. Guam, the largest and southernmost of the Mariana Islands and an unincorporated territory as well, lies within one of the most active regions for tropical cyclones in the world. The typhoons that have historically battered my island are so strong, they're often called super typhoons. Everyone here remembers their first. Mine was Omar in August, 1992. We were unprepared, my mother, brother, sister, and me. This was in part because my father, who typically did the preparatory work of putting up shutters and removing debris from around the house, had recently died. I remember the four of us huddled behind a cream-colored mattress. I remember tracing its embroidered flowers with my finger. I remember everything, really. Trees and telephone poles cracked in half. The roof of our neighbor's house went flying, as did his canopy and one of his cars. I remember glass everywhere as several windows and a sliding door shattered. I remember the sound of the wind as it blew under the bottom of my bedroom door, like an old man sucking his teeth. Pamela is the one my mom remembers. May 1976. One of the most intense storms to strike Guam last century, Pamela generated eight meter waves and ravaged the beaches on both the northern and eastern sides of the island. She sank 10 ships in the local harbor. She did an estimated $500 million worth of damage, but none of this is what my mom remembers. What she remembers, what she will never forget, is a single white toilet. American standard, the one thing left of her house when Pamela was over. Then there was Paca, December 1997. The wind and rain beat down on us for 12 hours. The barometric pressure was so low that it was believed to have induced labor in nine pregnant women. Paca, like Russ in 1990 and Yuri in 1991, unearthed untold numbers of dead bodies when it slammed into the southern cemeteries of Jotnia and Iran. Corpses spilled out of their coffins. Coffins bobbed like buoys in the bay. Several families spent weeks combing the beaches in search of their loved ones. Some were never found. My aunt, who worked for one of the cemeteries, said that one family was able to identify their father's body only because of a cherished baseball cap which they had buried him in and which had stuck to his skull by way of a mess of seaweed. Suffice it to say, when the IPCC dropped its latest report, confirming that tropical cyclones are just going to get stronger, my corner of the world shuddered. So that's just um, a short excerpt of a longer essay um, that The Atlantic published in November 2021 to coincide with the opening of yet another COP. Um, and I 
put all of my heart and soul into the essay. I tried to quiet down the noise, all the noise, um, because I find the global climate change discourse very, very noisy. I did try my best to quiet down that noise and to find something true to say. Um, and I'm honored that the conference named, you know, its event, your event after this essay. Um, enjoy the conference. I hope it's, I wish you every success. I hope it's awesome. Thank you. Um, before we uh, before we start our discussion today, I want to acknowledge that we're on the unceded lands of Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. We had a beautiful welcome to country last night, um, and I hope that our discussion today is well. I know our discussion today was framed by the understanding that this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I am very excited to welcome you all to this first panel, which. Um, gets to the heart of the purpose of the Australian Association for Pacific Studies, um, which focuses on the um, nature of Pacific Studies past, present and into the future. So the association, as you heard last night, was established here at the ANU. And since 2006, it's advocated for Pacific Studies and Pacific literacies. And Katarina in particular has advocated this um, not only in our universities, but at every level of schooling in Australia. I think until recently, most Australians would have known very little, not all Australians clearly, but many Australians, would have known very little and possibly cared very little to learn very much about our region. But growing geopolitical rivalries have led to unprecedented attention. Um, and I think that the recent federal election, we saw the region and Solomon Islands in particular occupy, occupy the attention of Australian media in a way that we've rarely seen before. Many of us would probably agree that this attention is not an entirely bad thing. Um, and as a Pacific Studies scholar, I've certainly welcomed the new conversations and spaces that it can potentially open up. But it has contributed to narrow and often very uninformed analyses. Um, often it's not Pacific people who are given the mic in those conversations. And in popular media and also in the pages of peer-reviewed scholarly journals, we see a lot of attention <coughs> being paid to climate change. Again, not an entirely bad thing, but climate change to security, to defence, to international relations, development, and to labour mobility, and also particular versions of these conversations. So our panel this morning is concerned with exposing and discussing and moving past some of the absences, presences, and power dynamics within Pacific Studies. Importantly, all of our panellists are concerned with critical, creative and empowering Pacific Studies genealogies, which we will discuss during our panel. And our discussions will turn to the possible futures of the field in its various forms across Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii and elsewhere. Each of our panellists has been crucial to defining and advancing the field of Pacific Studies. And each are located within uh, different geographies and different disciplinary spaces. You've got full bios in the conference background, but to introduce each of, I'll introduce each of them briefly here, and we'll also start our discussion um, with a conversation about how uh, they came into the field that we would call Pacific Studies. So, so Professor Emeritus Terence Wesley Smith is based at the Centre for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manawa. Terence has published extensively about Pacific Studies as an interdisciplinary field of inquiry and also about the implications of China's growing influence in the region. Terence comes from a political science background um, and his 1995 article, which Katarina mentioned last night, Rethinking Pacific Island Studies, um, is one of the defining pieces in our field. More recent publications include Remaking Area Studies, which was published in 2010 by University of Hawaii Press, and The China Alternative, which he edited with Graham Smith and published by ANU Press in 2021. Alistair Punga-Somerville writes and teaches at the intersection of literary studies, 
Indigenous Studies and Pacific Studies. And she's done so across New Zealand, Australia, and Hawaii. And she's currently in the Department of English Language and Literatures and the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies at the University of British Columbia. Her publications include the 2012 book, Once Were Pacific, Maori Connections to Oceania, as well as 250 Ways to Start an Essay about Captain Cook, and <laughs> always italicise how to write while colonised. <laughs> Professor Katarina Tewa is a Pacific Studies scholar, artist and award-winning teacher within the School of Culture, History and Languages here at the ANU. Her doctoral work was in anthropology and history, and she founded the Pacific Studies teaching program here at the ANU. Katarina is author of Consuming Ocean Island, Stories of People and Phosphate from Banaba, published in 2015. Katarina is of Banaban, Ikiribas, and African American heritage, and she was born and raised in Fiji. Um, she is, as you know, one of our conference conveners, and she's currently vice president of AAPS. And April Henderson is director of Baalman Pacifica, and I think I just mangled the pronunciation, I'm sorry, program in Pacific Studies and Samoan Studies at Victoria University of Wellington. Like Teresia Tewa, she, under, she undertook her PhD in the history of consciousness at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She then worked closely with Teresia Tewa to build Pacific Studies <clears throat> to build Pacific Studies programs and her research has focused on the circulation of music and performing and visual study art forms within and beyond the region. April has devoted a lot of her time to advancing Pacific Studies through supervision of postgraduate students um, and to creating publication opportunities for Pacific scholars. Um, along with Terence and Katarina, she's one of the editors of Sweat and Salt Water, an edited collection of Teresia Tewa's work. So now that I've introduced all of you, could you perhaps tell us a little bit about how you came into this field that we now call Pacific Studies? Um, perhaps Terence, I'll start with you. Start with the oldest. Yes, that was precisely <laughs> what I was thinking. Um, well, two words by accident, I think <laughs> it's appropriate. Um, I grew up in Ireland. I fled Ireland as a young man. I don't want to talk about the few years that I spent adrift, sorry, adrift in various parts of the world. And I found myself in New Zealand in the early 70s. Um, I also found myself gay found that there was an opportunity to go back to university to revive a terrible academic record at Victoria University of Wellington. And it was there that I got interested. I was new to the Pacific. I wanted to learn everything I could about the environment in which I now lived. So I studied about New Zealand's uh, history. I studied New Zealand's role in the Pacific. I got interested in Papua New Guinea and eventually I got a scholarship, much to my surprise, to go to the East West Centre in Honolulu uh, to do PhD at the University of Hawaii. Um, and when I was at UH, I did field work, I did my research uh, on the Panguna mine in Bougainville in search of the idea of the development of underdevelopment. I'm not sure that I found that. Uh, but that experience in Bougainville was, was totally life-changing for me. It had me questioning all sorts of things about myself, about scholarship, about how I had the audacity to say anything about a place as complex as that. Um, so when I came back, I, managed to finish the PhD and was lucky enough to be offered a job at the Center for Pacific Island Studies. So as I talk about in a minute, I found myself in an environment which I had to make sense of and I've been trying to make sense of it ever since. This way. 
Oh. Are you saying I'm going to solve this? Then I don't know, um, just to reiterate my, um, uh, my sense of humble gratitude to be uh, on these beautiful, these beautiful things on these beautiful lands and to, um, to start by acknowledging and, and recalling the, the, the beautiful warm welcome that we received yesterday um, afternoon. Um, yep, yeah, so I, I was thinking about this question and I realised that, um, so unofficially, um, I actually, <laughs> I'm kind of a, I kind of snuck into Pacific Studies. Um, so a lot of my mates were taking Pacific Studies when I was doing an undergrad um, at the University of Auckland. Um, and I was doing Māori studies and English. Um, my main, one of the main professors that taught me in English was Albert Wendt. Um, and he was actually the head of the Department of English at the time. So I experienced the English Department as, you know, like a Pacific Studies site. Like these were the conversations I was involved in. And it wasn't, I've written about this, it wasn't until years later I found out that English Department was unusually like that. <laughs> so, um, but my mates were taking Pacific Studies. My, my, um, my timetable was jammed because I made the mistake of thinking I do well being told to do law, and so I, I couldn't fit Pacific Studies in as well. But I just used to like sneak in and listen to the lectures. So I've been, um, I guess, uh, extracting <laughs> from Pacific Studies in a really dodgy way, or being really curious about Pacific Studies and just enjoying like the people in Pacific Studies, um, the friendships and networks in Pacific Studies, um, the conversations um, from back then. Um, uh, and then, because uh, I came from Canada, my brain's just a little bit catching with myself, so I did, uh, I did write something down. So, um, uh, Pacific Studies was something that um, I studied, um, I drew on in my PhD work, and then when I, I did my PhD in upstate New York, which is very snowy and landlocked, and I was very um, homesick for the ocean, and I knew if I went home to Old Sea Law, I'd never finish the PhD, because I get distracted by the fact that I was home, and there's just so much to do there. So um, I actually um, got a ticket and went to Hawaii with like, basically no connections or networks, and I did a total undercover thing in Hawaii. But Sina in the English department was going on sabbatical, um, a really amazing um, Samoan poet and, and a very scholar. Um, she was going on sabbatical, so she gave me her office. A Tahitian uh, undergrad of regional student gave me her like, campus login and password, so I could use that internet. <laughs> and Cephas um, gave me um, like an affiliation, which sounds cool, but basically it was a library card. So, <laughs> So, so Pacific Studies has, has opened back doors to me, for me um, into conversations and I crashed a lot of conferences that year um, and I, I, was, I was sent away from a couple of lunch tables for not having the lanyard. You know, I was, I was crashing everything. You can quite remember some of the things That's I was it. crashing that drove people crazy. Um, <laughs> Right, the Pacific the Caribbean one. But I was like, why are these people going on a flight and all these core Pacific people and all these other people get together and not us? <laughs> so I was a very rude, obnoxious, uninvited person um, because I wanted to hear the things that were being said. And I think that continues to be the case. I think as a Māori person, I have to have a complicated relationship with Pacific Studies. It will be inappropriate to not acknowledge the complexities of the relationship between Māori and the Pacific. Um, and so, so I hope that that's always an uncomfortable relationship, but I am too curious about what goes on here and too excited about what goes on in these conversations to stop sneaking around. And I've now made it my part of my life's work to help others also find their ways to these conversations because I know what they mean to me. Others. Um, I will also add my acknowledgement and my um, extreme gratitude for being able to be here. This has always been a favorite gathering for me, um, for the warm and nurturing environment it's always provided, especially for postgraduate students and uh, early career researchers. I'm looking at Terence because the workshop yesterday, um, Terence made some quite humorous comments about uh, uh, emerging researchers. Um, um, 
And my thanks as well um, to Serena Williams and her family for welcoming us so beautifully yesterday to Ninawal, uh, Nambri country. So my coming to Pacific Studies, I was partially raised in Hawaii, uh, the daughter of a settler mother who, who brought her and I there and finished high school there and then had a scholarship to attend undergraduate um, in Southern California. And like many people, whether they are Kanaka Maori or whether they are settler, that your attachment to place grows stronger when you leave that place. And I found during my four years of undergraduate in Southern California, um, an intensification of my feelings of connection to Hawaii. And over that four years, I also had the opportunity through a series of events I won't belabor um, to do a semester of a school term in Samoa as part of an exchange program, thinking I was going to go there to a place that would be familiar because I've been spending quite a lot of time hanging out with Samoans in Honolulu um, and finding, of course, like many people do, that um, hanging. Uh, in Samoan communities of Honolulu doesn't at all prepare you for going to Samoan um, and having probably the most sort of intense culture shock precisely for being so fearful and thinking I was going to know what was up. Um, but as part of that, I back in Honolulu before going on that trip, I had the opportunity to start taking Samoan language courses in summer session at University of Hawaii. Um, and after I finished undergrad, I should mention that I did undergrad in anthropology, and I think that is important. Terence talks about fleeing Ireland, I've written about fleeing anthropology. Um, and when I got back home to Hawaii, after um, a quite pleasant year selling stereo systems, I should say, it was a good job and I loved it, um, I was coaxed back into uh, graduate school. Um, and. I didn't know what I wanted to study, but I just knew I wanted a Pacific focus. That's just what was pulling on my heart, and I felt a certain responsibility um, as a child of a settler in the region to know more about the region um, and to see what I could do um, in the region. And as a result of that, and a scholarship that required me to choose a program, I ended up at the Center for Pacific Island Studies, um, where I was part of an amazing cohort with Katarina Tewa, Keith Camacho, who's at UCLA, um, Alexander Moyer, who's at UH, um, and, a, and a host of others. Um, and so that's sort of one of my official Pacific Island studies, as it's called, their um, uh, journey began. Um, and after that, as Terence, uh, or as, the, as Rebecca's introduction mentioned, um, as part of that two years at the Center for Pacific Island Studies, um, I was becoming aware of the extraordinary liter literature and intense kind of critical, uh, theoretical, and, and practical outputs that were coming out of a program called the History of Consciousness at UC Santa Cruz and the work of people like Vicente Diaz, who of course has been a, a prior um, Apelian Wolfram Memorial lecturer for this uh, meeting, um, Kehalani Kawanui, uh, and of course Teresa Atewa, and I've had the opportunity through uh, my friendship with Katarina to meet Teresia at that point. Um, and so I was working on a PhD in history of consciousness um, and doing research that was bringing me to Tifanulia, Farah, to Wellington, um, and Teresia, who at that point had founded Pacific Studies in 2000 and had been going it alone for two years, um, needed some time off and she needed some teaching support. And she knew I was coming for research anyway. And she said, okay, I'll negotiate this fixed term contract. Will you? Uh, work. <laughs> Will you help me so that she can take some research leave and uh, to have her youngest son? Um, and unbeknownst to me initially, she was working behind the scenes to spin that fixed term appointment into a full term appointment, um, and, and encouraged me as the kind of inside candidate to um, to apply for that. Um, and I. So I did, and I intended to stay on for another one or two years, and 21 years later, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I came to be and remain in Pacific Studies. Um, there have been a couple points where I had actually discussed with Teresia um, moving laterally into another program on campus, media studies or something, and Teresia, in her kind of absolute firmness, was always saying, no. <laughs> so I do, um, as, as somebody who is not of Pacific descent, I do have a whole range of, um, I think, 
constant reflections about um, the space that I inhabit in a program in Pacific Studies. I continue to inhabit because once again, um, I'm the only person in Pacific Studies. We've had my dear colleague, Emilani Case, um, uh, depart for uh, wonderful family opportunities in Auckland. Um, so I'm once again alone and we're hiring again. And um, yeah, so the, they're hiring. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, but I, I, I had a succession plan, it was a brilliant succession plan, and then my succession plan had another plan, so. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's me. Thanks so much, everyone, for sharing, um, and I'd also like to, again, acknowledge um, Serena's amazing welcome to everyone um, yesterday to Manoel country. Um, and for setting the stage for, for the conference. That was so amazing. Um, I don't know if I've shared enough, actually, my journey into Pacific Studies. I feel like I've written about lots of different things. And then when I think about it, I don't think, actually, I have told the story about how I entered Pacific Studies in public at all. Um, unless I'm forgetting which I do, a lot of random essays that I have written, but um, my, everyone's, people have talked uh, to an extent about different kinds of culture shock and other things they experienced along the way um, into Pacific Studies, and mine probably came in the reverse way, moving from Fiji to do an undergraduate degree at Santa Clara University in California, and despite being of African-American heritage having extreme culture shock um, in California uh, at Santa Clara University. One that was a combination of both culture and probably class, being, being surrounded by 18-year-olds who drove BMWs um, and coming from a country where you imagine maybe you'll own a car when you're 50, if you have any money. Um, so I, I, my younger sister and I had scholarships to go to Santa Clara University, which was a, a Catholic university, a Catholic Jesuit university, and one of the reasons we went there was because we were Catholic, and from our parents' perspective, following the Catholic pathway was a safe journey, a safe uh, um, possibility for their children, and there were also Pacific Islanders that we knew who were at Santa Clara University. Um, but I didn't do well in uni, at all, especially not for the first two years. Um, so I was kind of, the other shock was coming out of primary and secondary school in Fiji and doing relatively well academically and then absolutely crashing the first two years of uni and feeling quite lost. Um, one of the things that saved me was dance and so I had always danced all my life. Um, my mother was a dance teacher um, so I continued to dance in university, joined the very large um, group of Hawaiian students who were at Santa Clara who had a hula halau, um, and that provided some sense of familiarity at university. Um, but when I was finishing up, I, once again, to overlap with some of the um, other themes that are coming up in this conference, my options were to go to law school, and I actually applied to law school and got accepted to some law schools, or to follow a different path, which my elder sister, who's been referred to by most people here, Teresia, to follow an academic path, which I was not particularly interested in because my grades were not that good, and because I wasn't a very good writer. Um, I read a lot, but my writing skills, I didn't think, were very good. Um, and I was much better at embodied things. I was much better at visual arts, at dancing, and at doing things rather than having to sit still a lot and read and write. So my sister, however, was doing a master's degree in history at the University of Hawaii. And she was noticing, just like Alice, um, the Pacific Island Studies space. And she was probably thinking, oh, why didn't I do Pacific Island Studies? Because she'd sort of committed to history. So she started lobbying me to go um, and apply 
um, to the Pacific Island Studies program where Terence was at. And I was pretty, um, I knew nothing about it. I had done a bachelor's in science. Um, so I did physics, chemistry, biology, psychology. It was a combined science degree. Um, I wasn't good at sociology. Sociology was my worst subject, and I still don't understand sociology. Um, and anthropology um, actually offended me <laughs> quite a lot. Um, so I was having these awkward conversations with my anthropology professors about objectification, because I was having culture shock at the objectification of other cultures that I was learning in anthropology. But I wrote an essay about a mat that my grandmother wove for us as children as my submission to my um, um, application um, to the Center for Pacific Island Studies. And I recall that it was actually last minute and I was late for all the possible scholarship programs. So I didn't get any scholarships, um, but I got into the program. And because I think, because I was Teresa Taylor's sister, um, CFIS found different ways of kind of supporting and facilitating my entry into that program. And essentially I went from a student who got like C's and some B's and a couple of A's from time to time to a straight A student in the Masters for Pacific Island Studies program because it was like a switch went off and I was like, I went from to bing, like Pacific Island Studies was one of the most profound experiences of my life where for the first time I felt focused, I felt grounded and I felt empowered after studying a bajillion things from all the sciences to economics to ballet to music Pacific Island Studies felt absolutely incredible and I was totally straight A student after that. I also was a student who would try to sneak in different kinds of um, assessment. So they would say, could you please write a 1500 word essay and I would draw a comic. And I'd say, can this maybe be assessed and would this fit in with the requirements? Because I was pretty unconvinced that writing was the only and the dominant form of knowledge production. So I would be drawing, I would be dancing, and I would be trying, I would try to convince my professors that that was all valid knowledge that they should accept and assess. And that is something that I continue to do and take them all the way through my academic career now and open up spaces for my students to be able to do that and for it to count. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. I'm struck by how in different ways the thread through the conversation is already, it is um, the home. Everybody has found a sense of some kind of home, however unsettled that might be in Pacific studies. Um, so I wonder if we could uh, move our conversation to talking a little bit about the features that we see in that place that we've found a home. Terence, I'm going to start with you again because your piece, Rethinking Pacific Island Studies, has been so crucial for many people. Um, and it's one that shapes the present conversation. Why and how do you see interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary Pacific Studies emerging? And why do you see it as important? I'm glad that you earlier mentioned that I've published other stuff. <laughs> Otherwise, there might be a big question of how the hell did this guy survive? He published in <laughs> um, you know, I We do love your other work as well. Yeah. <laughs> and the 20 years later yeah. one too. <laughs> yes. Um, I thought it might be useful just to uh, look very briefly at some of the history of how this program, this discipline that we call Pacific Studies has emerged. And um, because I think there's a lot of resonance with what's happening today, and we should remember the history, particularly around uh, Apelli Haofa's vision, which I'll, I'll mention in a minute. Um, but to to set the scene, I think it's worth stating at the beginning 
that we're not, all of us on this stage anyway, we're concerned about a type of Pacific studies, a particular type of Pacific studies that operates with certain principles and certain assumptions and certain values. And it's not, as, it's not, as uh, Teresia put it, any and all studies of and about the Pacific. So we're talking about a very specific line of thinking about what Pacific Island studies should be. And, um, you know, it, I think up front, what encapsulates, what characterizes this type of study is that it's committed to the idea of self-determination. Yesterday we talked about the Blue Pacific at the heart of the idea of the Blue Pacific is self-determination. And, and our Pacific studies is built around that idea. It's built around the idea of decolonized ways of knowledge production about this amazing region. A version of Pacific studies, in other words, whose ultimate goal is empowerment. And it's worth remembering uh, Apelli's ideas. Uh, Apelli wasn't directly involved in Pacific studies, but his ideas were inspirational for those of us trying to think it through. And as you are well aware, um, back in the 90s, he very strongly advocated for the idea of a new, what he called the new oceanic consciousness. And it was, it, read his work again. It's radical. Mm -hmm. What he was proposing wasn't just entering the conversation. It wasn't just being part of the conversation. It was a radical reinterpretation of what knowledge about the Pacific should be. And he put it like this, to help free us from prevailing externally generated definitions of our past, present, and future. That's hugely that's a profound statement. Um, and, you know, he was in effect drawing attention to a Pacific version of what the great Palestinian intellectual, Edward Said, was talking about in his book, Orientalism, which I thoroughly recommend that you take a look at. And those of you who did it, see this, <laughs> can recite it from Asa. Um, what, what, I mean, what uh, Edward Said was talking about was Orientalism as a Western knowledge system for, quote, dominating, restructuring, and having authority over a particular part of the world, in his case, the Orient or the Middle East. And for Apelli and others who followed external narratives about the region represented a means for external countries to continue to exercise power over the region, all the more formidable because they were less visible, less obvious, more insidious than the material or structural ways of control exercised during the colonial period. So what Apelli was talking about was a structure of control, and his life work was determined to push back and uh, to develop alternative ways of thinking and being uh, in the Pacific. Um, I think it's worth remembering that a little bit about what's, what was happening at the time in Western academics, because I think those ideas were also important in what was to happen next. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember the, uh, those uh, decades ago, there was a whole movement in Western scholarship, within Western scholarship, that people called uh, postmodernism or post-structuralism, uh, which was challenging some of the, the assumptions about Western scholarship. Essentially, really, when you get down to it, challenging the idea of objectivity, which, from which Western scholarship got its authority, derived its authority by saying, we're objective, 
were neutral and were universal. And there were trends within Western acad academia to challenge that. Um, indigenous studies was emerging as a powerful counterforce. Um, feminist, feminist studies was also challenging these central ideas. So there were all sorts of things going on uh, that fed into this idea of a new type of way of thinking about Pacific studies. Um, I remember coming back from my studies in Bougainville, thoroughly confused, and really my confidence uh, in Western scholarship was completely eroded by that experience. It just didn't serve me well. I, it didn't help me try to figure out what was going on in a completely different cultural environment. And I began to realize the enormity of what I was proposing to do, which was to write about this in some authoritative way, to tell the world what was happening in Bougainville and how the Bank Panguna mine was impacting its future. Um, so I, I had moments of doubt about that. It just seemed outrageous. And there was a lot of literature which helped me try and think some of that through. And one of the people that I remember reading and feeling comforted by was James Clifford, who uh, worked with Teresia and Vince and, and April, of course, because he was an anthropologist who was having, uh, he was critiquing his, his field. And I remember a collection of writing, of a book called Writing Culture, which influenced my thinking at the time. And cultural studies was emerging at the time as the sort of um, uh, spin-off of anthropology and, and inspired by some of the same kind of critical ideas. So there was a lot happening. And in my, on my campus, here I was, this Irish instructor in Pacific Island Studies, <laughs> appearing in front of classes full, at that time, of many Hawaiian students, students of Hawaiian ancestry, who had come through Hawaiian studies, which was flourishing on the campus at the time. And Hawaiian studies didn't have an MA degree, so when people graduated with the BA, they were sent over to us. And so here I was, a young, well, not so young, actually, but... Um, <laughs> A person trying to figure out how to deal with with the the sort of blank stares and the critique that was coming at me for what was I doing here? What was I doing teaching Pacific, Pacific studies? Um, Hanani K. Trask was the leader of that movement. We we saw her referred yesterday as one who passed recently. Uh, she was my colleague, she was uh, Katarina's mentor. Um, she scared the hell out of me, to be honest. <laughs> uh, she wrote, you know, her famous phrase, what do you mean, we, white man? <laughs> it was intimidating for a young, untenured professor. Uh, but on the other hand, we both lived on the windward side of Oahu, uh, she didn't have a driving license, so I would give her... <laughs> <laughs> and we would talk, you know, she, she didn't... We, we talked about Ireland, actually. We talked about Irish language revival, which she was very interested in. So we were, we were friends, we were colleagues and friends, but boy, yes, she scared the hell out of me. <laughs> so... Um, so just a little bit um, to finish up on um, the, the sort of background to this article that's been mentioned many times. It's brilliant, actually. <laughs> um, but the, the context was um, I was asked to review our curriculum in the Center for Pacific Island Studies. We had an MA degree that's been mentioned that was founded in 1950, for goodness sake. 
and it needed to be reviewed in the face of all those changes that were occurring. So I was given the job to do a report about curriculum and make recommendations for how the curriculum might be reviewed. And when I set about that task, I found that there was nothing to guide me. There was literally nothing. Nobody had written about Pacific Island studies. Uh, Ron Crocombe had written uh, descriptively about Pacific studies, but it wasn't analytical and it wasn't foundational in, in philosophy. What are the founding principles of this idea? And we were part of something called area studies in the United States. So I was in a school which was, we had a million centers. There was Philippine studies, there was Southeast Asian studies, there was East Asian studies. So I looked into their literature, and they didn't have any foundational literature either. <laughs> so when I started looking at area studies generally, I found that there wasn't any foundational literature, that it was an instrumental uh, invention after World War II essentially for the United States to be familiar with parts of the world in which it was operating as, a, as an emerging superpower. And it was what I, in my essay, called the pragmatic approach. We need to know about our enemies and we need to know about our friends. And when I read that, I sort of gulped. I realized that I was effectively part of a colonized field of study. There was no other way of thinking about it. And area studies is so unusual in the Western Academy because everything else is based on a discipline. So you have history and you have sociology and political science in the professional schools. And then you have this thing called area studies, which is based on an area, for God's sake. And it turns out that even the area that you're talking about, where did that come from? It's not fixed. So you're actually sort of creating an area. And we're living through a phase now where other people are creating other areas that call the Indo-Pacific. It's an entirely geostrategic creation. So these were horrifying realizations for me and it made me wonder what I was doing and whether it was sustainable, whether I could live with this and in this. And then I explored other rationales for Pacific studies. The laboratory one didn't make me feel much better <laughs> because it was, feel, it was disciplines that used the Pacific as a laboratory to explore their ideas about linguistics or culture or whatever, but it wasn't for Pacific, it was a, it, they were subjects to be processed into some bigger scheme of intellectual knowledge which didn't have anything to do with the region. And so the third rationale was of course the empowerment rationale and that fed into, that connected with the other things that I mentioned that were going on, right? indigenous studies, Hawaiian studies, Hanani K. Trask, um, you know, it was a, an alternative way of thinking about it. Um, and uh, I think that's um, hopefully what we, can, what we can explore as we go on in the discussion. What are the characteristics of this? What are the problems with it? What do we need to think about next? Um, but um, I, I have to say that a, a gathering like this, thinking back to Apelli's work 30 years ago, I think Apelli would be absolutely thrilled. He would, I think, would be surprised about how influential his ideas had become in the, in the intervening decades. So. April, I'm going to go to you next because, as you mentioned, you've been based in New Zealand developing Pacific Studies programs for the last 21 years. And I wonder what you see as being similarities and differences, the characteristics of the New Zealand version of Pacific Studies. And also, Terence raised the issue of relationship with other disciplines. 
and so I wonder how you see the relationship building just going. So I'll ask you, and then I'll invite Katarina and Alice to um, speak to these themes that Terence has raised from their vantage point. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my late colleague Terence Utewa has probably done perhaps the most as a single person to kind of give airtime to your essay. I remember, you know, in one of her first essays talking about it, Terence, she was like, expressing her shock that more people weren't reading it, but now more people are, and of course we've been assigning it from um, day one in our Pacific Studies program. Um, both the original essay and the um, 20 years on follow-up. Um, and when I discuss with students, whether it's on a 100 level course um, or our, our postgraduate course on theory and methodology in Pacific Studies, when I'm discussing your work, Terence, and the rationales that you just took us um, through, I then post questions to the students about, you know, what, what sort of rationales do you think motivated the establishment of our Pacific Studies program here at, at Tehede Golanka Victoria University? And of course students always, you know, oh, empowerment rationale, it's clearly the empowerment rationale. And yes, that is true, but then I often want to coax students to think about New Zealand, and I intentionally use the word New Zealand because I'm referring to the state and its institutions, um, New Zealand's own domestic pragmatic rationales for administering and servicing its quite substantial Pacific populations. And I think if those uh, pragmatic needs as set by uh, policy and implemented through ministries and then as they filter down through the tertiary education commission and uh, university prioritization, if there was not, you know, over 8% of the population that is of Pacific descent now, if those students were not a targeted population um, in terms of, you know, what it's called currently equity, diversity, and inclusion, if the TEC, the Tertiary Education Commission, was not setting targets for Pacific successful completion and so forth, um, all of these things are very much, um, I think, afoot in terms of universities giving the green light and the go-ahead to the Ford Pacific Studies. So in some ways, um, there, there is much more, I think, um, widespread recognition across New Zealand of um, the value of having Pacific Studies and um, in, in the various institutions. Um, so certainly there is, there is in, you know, um, there, there's certainly the pragmatic rationale that Terence, uh, that Terence talked about in terms of um, the proliferation of narratives about security, concern about China, um, couch as New Zealand's narratives of itself so often are in a kind of self-congratulatory comparative vein with how they do things better than Australia in terms of partnering with the Pacific, um, which was recently helped when Penny Wong uh, visited New Zealand and said, you know, we have much to learn from your incorporation of uh, Te Tiriti um, in, in your foreign policy and so forth. Um, so there's, there's certainly that foreign policy pragmatic rationale afoot, but I think in terms of the way um, the rationales influence programs, it's often, as I said, about um, an interest in um, providing programs that support um, the the recruitment, retention, and success of Pacific students, domestic Pacific students. Um, and I mean, maybe to bring the conversation down to a really practical level, um, in terms of that pragmatic rationale, I, I have these ambivalences and conflicts. So anybody who teaches in a named Pacific Studies program, and I know many of you here teach in other fields or disciplines, um, this conference gathers many of us together from, from different places. But if you teach in a named program or department in Pacific Studies, whether you're doing that in Utah, whether you're doing that in La Guille at Brigham Young University, Hawaii, whether you're doing that at UH Manoa or here at ANU, we all face the same question which is how to address, when we're doing our recruitment visits, when we're visiting secondary school, addressing the question that comes from Pacific students especially and from their parents, what do you do with the degree in Pacific Studies? 
That is the, no matter where you are, that is the question that you will have to address when you are trying to ensure that you have a, a, a sufficient students in your program to, to survive, right? Um, and fortunately for us, because of these pragmatic um, recognition in New Zealand, I have a very ready and, and quite successful answer to that because I can look around the New Zealand ministries and every ministry has a specific team. And in many of those teams now, the highest rate Pacific person has an affiliation or is a graduate from program. Mm -hmm. So I can point and I could say, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, one of the highest rate Pacific people has a degree in Pacific Studies from Victoria University. I can point to Ministry of Health. I can point to a range of uh, you know, functionaries of the state and so, on the one hand, and I spoke about my deep ambivalences, on the one hand, I absolutely need that sort of recognition to keep my program alive. <laughs> because it's, it's what allows me to ensure that parents will send their students to our program. Uh, that they'll say, okay, you're not you know, throwing your degree away because you're not doing law or economics or in many cases, um, because of the degree structure of Victoria University, most of our students um, do a, a double major at least, sometimes a double degree. Um, so oftentimes they're taking Pacific Studies alongside something else anyway, which satisfies parents. Um, but they will tell you, and, and my students will stand up and say, yes, I did a major in this, you know, to satisfy my parents because it looks good on paper, but Pacific Studies is what I use in my job every day. So we have fabulous graduates who've been really successful. Our alumni are, you know, they roll deep and they're an incredible network um, and they're fabulous. Um, and we bring them in to class and connect them with our current students. Um, but the other side of that ambivalence is, and I think um, there's ways in which, I think it links back to what Terence was talking about in terms of the true radicalness of the public health is, vision, and Terence Hewitt said, you know, it wasn't just about getting a seat at the table or entering the conversation. Um, and ways, there might be ways in which we could um, link it to debates over the politics of recognition. What does it mean to be sort of recognized or pragmatically seen as valuable? It provides our graduates entry into well-paying jobs, which is fantastic. Um, but I do have these questions about, you know, what ultimately is possible when the bulk of our graduates become sort of functionaries of the state and the ways in which um, they, they may be then tasked, what are the limitations, what are the possibilities and limitations for what they can do in those spaces? Who is setting the narrative um, and how then um, does their recognition also hinder um, what they might be able to achieve or change the conversation in those spaces. So that was a, a couple things that I just wanted to mention and put out there. Because, yeah, I think oftentimes we do want to talk in, um, maybe at a level up here, about the incredible potential of thinking in Pacific Studies, but at the end of the day, I need to get my students jobs. <laughs> So it's, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So Alice, I was going to ask you to speak from your vantage points, which have been various across your career. Um, and also particularly to speak to this question of, you know, in a recent essay you wrote on settler colonial studies, you made the point that not everybody is enriched by new approaches. And I think we're seeing um, there's, at least in my field of inter or transdisciplinary inquiry, there's an uptick in interest in Pacific perspectives at the moment, but I would ask some of the questions that have been raised by the panel, and I, I'm just wondering what you're seeing in the fields that you work across in the different geographies you've worked across. Thank you. Um, so my career's been a series of um, mistakes and fails, <laughs> which has been really great because I've got to work to lots of new jobs because the other one didn't work out. So. <laughs> Don't talk about racism in New Zealand universities, that's why I've been on the Anyway, Canada's really nice. That's why I'm here. Um, but yeah, I've been on the Anglo-Canadian Institute for 
so, um, you know, uh, um, yeah, so I, I thought that I would um, read something that, um, this is how I started describing what I do. Um, it's just a short thing, it's something that I've, I've started to use to kind of explain to myself and to people at sort of the beginning of my like formal presentations and they're like, oh, what's this person do from far away? Um, or whatever. So, um, my life's work has turned out to be finding ways to restitch the stories of my own people back into the wider Pacific region and to understand how the threads that previously held them together came to be unraveled over the past two centuries. The thread I stitch with is literary studies, a focus on textual production, creative networks, histories and politics of publishing and so on. But the needle that I hold is an alloy melted from two metals, indigenous studies and Pacific studies. I've stitched a few things in my time with this combination and this needle, and I continue to sew and plan and dream of future projects. And I say that because for me, um, I sort of spent time bouncing between Pacific Studies and Indigenous Studies, and actually um, the opening a couple of pages of my PhD, which is now an ancient text, <laughs> long ago, um, uh, in the opening pages I actually spoke about my bookshelf as like a way of kind of thinking about the way and the work that I do in relation to these kind of disciplinary forms, and I was like, so in my bookshelf on my study, like my top shelf is all my Māori books, and then I've got like, I've a lot of Pacific Studies books and I've a lot of Indigenous Studies books, and the question is who goes on the second shelf, and then who goes on the third shelf, right? Yeah, I don't know, I've spent how many, I have two decades now as an academic, I still haven't quite figured that one out. Um, they both belong as number two. Um, that's, that, that's partly because of the intersections of where my community sits within conversations in Indigenous Studies and Pacific Studies. And my career has also been jumped between the institutional forms as well as the informal networks um, of both of those kind of interdisciplinary fields. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, um, you, you mentioned that I kind of jumped around and, and I have these different affiliations to Pacific Studies. Um, I think Pacific Studies is, is it's important for us to, and I'll always champion advocate for institutional formations of Pacific Studies, but I don't think that you have that everyone who's not like, um, <laughs> I think the parents are like, the rest of us are like, not really Pacific Studies people, right? At the same time as all of us who are based in other disciplines, must understand that if Pacific Studies loses its institutional formation, um, we've lost the discipline. Does that make sense? So like actually there's a particular kind of work that occurs which is institutional and that's important work. And maybe connected to some of the things that April's been saying, this is partly about resource and it's partly about visibility and it's partly about what happens when these conversations are at the centre and it's also about kind of having a um, a place where we know the genealogies are going to be taught, and genealogy in the Pacific of course being kind of multi-directional. So origin stories, but also future, future stories, um, and natural stories. So, um, so, so we often think about kind of what specific studies in relation to these um, institutional forms, uh, but I also think Pacific studies is founded in the bibliography. Um, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in studying all my critical reading, like seeing what someone's been reading, and then I'll start with the introduction after that. Right? I'm like, okay. And I think that's fine, eh? because it's nice to start with genealogy. Um, um, the, the question of whether um, individual scholars have specific training or not, I think is a tricky question. Um, I didn't have the MA from Busca. I'm like, oh, I'm a bit cheap, that, so I'm just going to be unfiltered here. I didn't have the EMA from CEPIS, and for a long time that made me feel like a real outsider and interloper in the conversation. I mean, I'm through one of the official finishing schools in Pacific Studies. So I was like, here's random Alice. Isn't she kind of hilarious and ridiculous? I mean, she keeps coming back, so, you know. And, um, and there's, you know, I've gone through insecure times in my life, right? It's just so mean to me, but actually, they were really thinking about me. So, it's not for everyone's universe, just my own. So, and I say that because um, I, I really think um, 
you know, we need to think carefully about what, what we mean when we talk about a discipline beyond the institutional form, because I, I feel intensely territorial about Pacific studies, and this connects to, like, people who come in and they go, oh, yeah, hey, um, yeah, I decided to, like, cut and paste something from the Pacific into some tiny part of my work, and now I'm a Pacific studies scholar, so that's cool. Yeah. Or, um, oh, yeah, hi, I, I went to the Pacific once, so now I'm accessing this funding. Or like, oh, hi, Captain Cook, we haven't died, it's me. Or, you know, like... <laughs> And so I'm, in t I'm intensely territorial about Pacific studies at the same time as I, I, I don't want to be intent, I don't want to prop up forms of territoriality that only refer to uh, academic institutional formations. So then what other forms of territoriality do we have available to us, right? And what other ways do we kind of, you know, what's our checklist for whether something or someone or a genealogy or a book or whatever, like, you know, what is it and how do we not turn it into some, you know, the, 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 we, we, can, we can think about these risks, eh? Um, I, I've been, I was kind of uh, thinking about, you know, what, how, how do we, we, we think about with all of these people coming in, you know, because I look like one of them too. And I don't have any degree in Pacific Studies. Eh? I only stole my training in Pacific Studies in undergrad because I was a company my mate's big head. And honestly, I had a crush on everybody who was in Pacific Studies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, the aesthetics of Pacific Studies is my new book. I just think. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's something important for me about thinking about the many, the many forms of relationality in the academy um, that, that produces these kinds of, um, these, this thing that we think of as specific studies. And I think for me, you know, coming to AAPS is an important part of that, you know, um, making it a priority, um, you know, being, being aware that, that there's a, um, it's a big ask for my husband to have um, actually not looked for work in Canada um, until I get back from this conference, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, because we knew we needed someone to look after our five-year-old, mm -hmm. right? So it's our family commitment to get me here as my husband's out of work right now. He leaves the job and he hasn't looked for any work, just so I could be here. Mm -hmm. And now I'm not saying that, you know, to be a martyr, but I'm saying this is what it means to be part of this, you know, this, this, this feel, right? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a family business, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't intend to go there, but there we go. A little bit of jet lag and I opened my heart to you all. Um, so I, I also wanted to talk about the other kind of subtle institutional network forms. I was thinking about the kind of the shadow discipline that is who are the people who are asked to examine theses in Pacific studies, right? So, you know, so there are kind of all of these different forms of networks and I kind of want to say to people who are like, oh, hi, I'm Samantha and I just discovered the Pacific is this exciting. I want to say, cool, and how many PhDs have you got downloaded on your iPad right now that you have to examine in the next couple of weeks, right, for other universities, right? So it's, so it's that kind of shadow undercover stuff that is also about being a part of this well i mean there's a beautiful side to that and i'm not setting that up as kind of like a, a draining and terrible labor to do but what are the forms that a, that a discipline takes it's the person it's the people who know that you're the person they can email and go hey i've got a great thesis coming can you examine it for me right so there's kind of me so i want i guess i wanted to kind of think about the many the many not departmental or program but still institutional forms that a discipline can take, that for me, yeah, give me some ways to think about territory, actually. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to, um, yeah, I guess I wanted to speak about the, the, the ways that moving around um, has given me a way to think about how Pacific studies and thinking about the Pacific um, is different in the different sites I've been. Um, you know, it's totally shaped by the logics of the Pacific in each context where it's located. I'm in Canada, we now they talk about the Trans-Pacific 
which FYI has nothing to do with it. <laughs> um, you know, people are, people are always saying, oh, this is Alice, she's a trans-Pacific scholar. Oh, I'm a Pacific scholar. Yeah, and the way they put in trans on the front is that it's fancy Pacific scholar. It's not, right? So, but that's the logic that I didn't have to make arguments about in my last job because that was a different, you know, different logic. Um, and each site that I've been Pacific Studies is responding to different Pacific communities and in that space, which of course has to do with the histories of how it is that Pacific people have moved through and around the region. Um, and each uh, place that I've been Pacific Studies is shaped by hmm, is shaped by the indigenous context where it's found itself. And frankly, I think that there's a little bit more work that could be done in some parts of Pacific Studies. And I want to say, because we have a say in Māori, you don't speak about, you know, the Kumara doesn't speak about its own sweetness, but that's nice because it gives those of us who are the Kumara the opportunity to speak to the sweetness of the Kumara. You know, I, I have... Um, the reason I cherish the WAPU space, and I want to say this openly to the leadership of, of this space, is because I think this is the place where, more than any other place, the relationship, they're still figuring it out, but genuine relationship with local indigenous communities and context and politics and sovereignty that is central to the thread of the conversations at this conference. Um, I think that that is something that underpins then the work of Pacific Studies in this place so that it doesn't become a settler colonial formation. I think that is a massive risk that that Pacific Studies in some places is being wielded as a settler colonial formation, right? That it is actually taking place and not taking as a starting point indigenous sovereignty where it is. And man, if you're not starting there, you're just part of the problem. And I think we, we need to... Ideally, the Epeli dreamed, the Terrence dreamed, the everybody dreamed version of Pacific Studies that we should, we should be the place where we get this right, and so it's more embarrassing on us if we get this wrong. Yeah, and I feel hopeful about the potential of the work that I see working in this area, but I think it's, it's hard work, um, and I'm excited about the panel yet to come, um, where people are going to be kind of foregrounding this conversation here. Um, yeah. Okay, and finally, I just want to put a little shout out that my thinking about, I don't, I don't have time to, to go into it in depth, but I have been thinking a lot about, um, or with, uh, and yes, as they say in Canada, it's a new phrase, but I've been thinking with, instead of reading, it's like a cool way to say reading, so I've been thinking with, as you say, by uh, an African American scholar called Jennifer C. Nash, and she has an, an article from Diacritics in uh, 2020 called Citational Desires on Black Feminism's Institutional Longings. And it's a beautiful essay because what she talks about is, and we have, we have made these arguments because we want people to see us and engage us. And we want black feminism to be engaged by so many scholars and we see the potential for, for what can happen when that occurs. Um, and now all these people have started engaging and we don't think this is what we were asking for, right? Appropriation. Same old power structures. Same old people actually getting to reproduce the power structures, having appropriated the work, right? And I think that this, this question becoming what are our institutional longings? What, what do we desire? Um, and how do we how do we articulate for ourselves and to each other this gap between the thing that I think some of us for a while have thought we were, or, you know, I've spent so much of my career going, hello, chill out, I'm Alice, what about the Pacific? Have you considered the Pacific in your conversation? And now I'm more like, ah, chill out, I'm Alice, please don't talk about the Pacific. <laughs> Up the track, why are you discovering the Pacific again? Like, this is, this is not, and so then what then is our institutional longing, right? And, and for me, I found that thinking with that particular essay has helped me think about it because she, she comes to it um, from a point of view of, of attempting to elaborate an institutional longing that is not at its heart about kind of incarcerative territoriality, but still is about holding firm to a particular vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
And that's a perfect point at which to turn to Katarina because it is a time of heightened interest in in, the, in all things Pacific in Australia. So Katarina, I'm wondering if you can speak from your vantage point. And then after this, I thought we would go to, we have um, a, a video from Tassis' Kabatamaka, who's obviously spoken a lot about these issues as well. So we might go to that and then we'll have some time for a Q&A before we go to our, we're running late for morning tea, but we'll still have time for morning tea. Um, so Katarina, do you want to speak to those issues of the, just the rising interest in the region, the, the securitisation, and also these points that Alice raised about the potential to become another form of settler colonialism and, and institutional models. I really relate to the um, what you just said at the end about, can everyone think about the Pacific? And now we're in the, no, 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 it's OK, let's not talk about the Pacific. Because we really have gone from a zero to a 100 level of um, interest in the region um, and when I was hired in 2007 to uh, work on coordinating uh, the first ever Pacific Studies teaching program at the ANU, an institution that had been focused on the Pacific since 1947 but not doing any undergraduate teaching on it, um, we were struggling to get like nine students in a class. If, if we hit the double digits, it was exciting to have 10 students sitting in a Pacific Studies class. But definitely the parents and definitely the schools and definitely the primary and secondary system and the whole of Australia was not supporting any form of pathway into studying the Pacific um, at an undergraduate level. We had PhD students who would come in internationally or from the region, a very small number who are actually Pacific Islanders um, doing research on the Pacific, but it was a very top heavy kind of um, enterprise with big professors, uh, big policy folks, people who worked on constitutions, people who did good work in the region, but then it got really thin and skinny <laughs> the further down you went in terms of um, the, the university structure and, and higher education. So we really struggled, trying to wrangle about 30 researchers on the Pacific to actually think about entering an undergraduate classroom. Um, and that seemed to give lots of people anxiety, <laughs> um, which was fascinating because it meant that a lot of the interesting work, primarily that was laboratory and pragmatic, sorts of Pacific studies happening at the ANU did not particularly filter out into communities or into the islands or anywhere else. So it was a very elite um, kind of ivory tower type of Pacific studies that was happening at the ANU, but particularly of the linguistics, archaeology, anthropology, history, um, political science, later law, um, and not a lot of the stuff I love, which was in the arts and in the performing arts and in music and dance and the visual arts. So it was very, very difficult to try to figure out what kind of Pacific studies we were going to have here and it, at an institution that had been heavily critiqued for its brand of Pacific studies by the rest of Pacific studies. And when um, Terence uh, and April um, talk about the kind of genealogy in Pacific studies that we're particularly situated in, um, that's really, really important for an institution like ANU um, and Pacific studies throughout Australia to think about because there's only a very small number of us in Australia uh, in the settler colony that actually do that form of Pacific studies. There's a lot of kidnapping, who was talking about kidnapping yesterday, and hijacking of our ideas, and a kind of rebranding of some other pragmatic and laboratory, laboratory looking spaces, as if they were the forms of creative, transdisciplinary, critical Pacific studies. But just to be frank, there's only a few people here that actually understand the genealogy that truly inhabit it and are practicing it in their teaching, their research, their policy work, and anything else. So 
Um, the question of appropriation of some of these ideas is very real, and that's one of the reasons why in some contexts I'm like, no, no, that's okay, let's just not talk about the Pacific, because it's actually quite disturbing and painful at times to hear your ideas and your language and your creativity and your originality and innovation hijacked and kidnapped by other spaces in order to appear to be doing a particular kind of engaged, family, friendly type of Pacific studies that serves the greater purposes, say, of the Australian government, um, who is trying to reframe, which is a good thing, trying to reframe and rethink its relationship with the Pacific, but is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight by suddenly saying we're all part of one big Pacific family, and then just sort of trotting out that discourse whenever it's um, convenient. Those of us who are part of Pacific families know how complicated and how deep and how much social responsibility that comes with. Um, so sometimes it feels really um, uncomfortable to be in a context where that sort of language of kinship is constantly um, hijacked to serve other usually pragmatic um, and often laboratory purposes as well. Um, so I think these, these issues that everyone's raised are really real, and I think those of us um, in Pacific Studies in Australia, and still we are a very small, small group, um, really need to think about what some of the goals um, that, you know, something like the Australian Association for Pacific Studies, or any of us in our different corners of universities who are promoting Pacific Studies, what some of our broader shared goals might be. One of them is definitely to do this work better than Alice has signaled about not just paying attention, but making that um, engagement and dialogue and difficult conversations that we need to have with those whose country we are on. The fact that we are settler colonials just like everyone else. However, we also come from deeper kinships that go back those 60 to 80,000 years that we need to have serious discussions about. If we're going to think about land, we're going to think about 60,000 years of land and whether or not Papua New Guinea and the continent of Australia were one landmass where people were able to move across, for example. So we're going to think about these things in deep time. That doesn't forgive anything, that doesn't make any, and people coming here and migrating to Australia and not thinking about whose country they're on, that doesn't make that any better, but we have to have those conversations in order to figure these things out. So that's some of the work we 100% have to do. The other one that's important for AAVS is thinking through this issue of Pacific literacy. So we started talking, AAVS has been talking about the importance of Pacific literacy at all levels of schooling for a long time, and recently, because of the increased interest in the region, um, the Pacific literacy discussion came up again and was immediately hijacked by people talking about security studies and saying, because I'm teaching a class on Pacific security, that's great, and therefore I'm doing Pacific studies. And to go back to Terence's point, it was like, oh, there are Pacific studies and there's Pacific studies. And not everything with a Pacific topic a Pacific content is Pacific study. So let's just make that really clear to everyone um, because it's wonderful to all the wonderful, beautiful work in the region that you need to do and everyone has their own genealogies, literatures and sense of integrity about it. But what we're furthering here is really quite particular. Critical, transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary, um, creative, Pacific studies. And there's been more and more conversations about the creative part as well. There's this huge resurgence of interest in the creative, and everyone putting it into a laboratory context. So let's study the creative, and where does this come from? Um, we've been doing that kind of stuff for, for a long time. So the, the genealogies we come from, we're only starting to notice that other people are now kind of catching up with it and starting to go back and read, read these essays that we have known for 20, 30 years inside our bones. Um, so that, that sort of appropriation and hijacking and kidnapping is something that we need to be attentive to. It's not to not be generous with our ideas and our work, that that's not the issue, but it is a question of sovereignty. 
and self-determination and citing ourselves, which we need to do more of, which is the title of the exhibition that's going on in the Minsky's <laughs> Library right now, which I encourage all of you to go and explore because it tracks a particular genealogy in Pacific studies that focuses on ANU histories and also how they intersect with other genealogies of Pacific studies. Um, and Tale and Lisa and others have done incredible work trying to assemble that content um, to showcase our, our history. So on one hand, we're getting more students and that's wonderful, but on the other hand, I'm just really aware of how the speed of which this interest in the Pacific is happening right now, this rush, this rush for the Pacific, this rush for Oceania, is something we have to be extremely cautious about as well and do it on our own terms. Not just because there's money, not just because someone got a grant, not just because some amazing support appeared out of nowhere, but to truly think through whether or not this interest in the Pacific is happening in a way that it works for us. Not just us as in indigenous Pacific Islanders or even Pacific Islanders, but all those committed to an ethical uh, kind of engagement with the Pacific that is aware of the many complex problems that we're experiencing right now and cares deeply for this ocean and these islands. And you don't have to be an indigenous Pacific Islander to care deeply about these oceans and these islands. It's all inclusive, but there has to be a sense of sovereignty and self-determination over that process. Okay, Yuki, jump in. <laughs> Um, I cannot ignore your hand. Okay. Do you want me to speak to the mic? Yes, please, because I'm passionately deep. You've got that. Just think. Uh, so I just uh, want to make a comment as somebody that is outside of academia. I know that, you know, once students enroll into Pacific Studies, they, when they graduate, uh, you've got, you know, you know, you just wish them luck. But unfortunately, there are some graduates of Pacific Studies who go out there in the real world and get jobs and in turn hurt the Pacific community. And that's another difficult conversation that I think we need to have. Is that how come that these graduates of Pacific Studies go join the system only for them to graduate from Pacific Studies and hurt the very community they study and they supposedly serve. Yuki might need to be more specific with that question. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not going to name names of the graduates of Pacific Studies who join the system and inflict pain onto the community. Because, you know, I expect people that graduate from Pacific communities to have some kind of like a ethical standing to how they engage with Pacific communities. But they do totally reverse once they join the workforce. And I've seen a couple of them. And then so that makes me think like, well, what is it in Pacific studies that makes them behave this way? <laughs> Yeah, without being more specific, for the example that I know exactly what you're talking about, I'm not sure we can blame Pacific Studies. I think what we are talking about are all those forces around it who hijack it, who then also mentor and take on board Pacific Studies students and bring them under their wings. So the mentoring in Pacific Studies is not just done by the scholars sitting here, for example. There's many other agents and actors around the field who have a particular interest in Pacific Studies, who hang out with Pacific Island Studies folks and who are deeply associated with it, but also have feet and hands in other disciplinary pools and spaces. They might be through research grants, they might be through the fields they work in. So I'm not sure without specifics that we can talk 
about who's responsible for those kinds of graduates that you're talking about. But I think it's a valid um, critique to put out there, absolutely. Um, I, I have no idea that the country is <laughs> So I'm just going to say something really funny. Um, one of my favorite, favorite critiques on indigenous US domestic colonizing methodologies is a review where, well, funny, I saw a review go, <laughs> um, oh my god, a Maori saying critique of Mr. Dean Westman. Yes, it has a cube in the world, shocking. So, um, <laughs> anyway, so um, one of my favourite critiques from another Indigenous scholar from another place is that, is that there's a risk um, that we start to articulate in a case of discipline of Indigenous studies or Indigenous education, whatever the kind of formation is. Um, that we, that we start to unconsciously articulate these disciplines and, and in particular the, the things that are not just the intellectual institutional bits, so the kind of the emotion, the heart, the passion, the politics, the sort of all this, that we might accidentally, we risk accidentally articulating these along a kind of uh, structure that feels like a Christian conversion narrative, right? That we're kind of winning hearts and souls from Pacific studies and we're kind of giving these sacred texts <laughs> that fell from the Irish heavens, you know. <laughs> and I think, I think what's really important, and I, am, I, I, I do need to be really clear that I'm not actually for a minute here um, wanting to dismiss the significance and importance of Christian conversion and faith for people involved in Pacific <laughs> So it's not about making fun of that, but it's saying that is not the, the right structure no. of logic mm. to make arguments for an academic discipline. Yeah. And I think that the, the risk is that we, out of a desire to articulate, you know, the Church of Pacific Studies is what it can sound like, in which case any of our converts you know, who may err from the sacred teachings. You know, we may we may then say that they have been lost, you know, and we have not properly trained them enough. But you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm, I'm being flippant about this, and maybe it shouldn't be something I'm as flippant about, but I think for me it becomes what are the metaphors of the logics around how we, how we articulate the, the way that Pacific Studies is not just about the, and it's not just an, an academic, uh, intellectual pursuit, although it is that, but it's how do we talk about the ways that it's not just that, that then doesn't accidentally fall into narratives that set us up for, for, you know, maybe, I have, I know, I have seen students walk across graduation stages to get a BA in English and I taught them in their last semester and these people got a C on the essays because they still can't write me. Do you want me like, yes, like, exactly. like a degree from a university is not, a, you know, it's, it's, it's an authorizing qualification, yeah. but it can only be understood to stand in for the things that one's required to do to get that qualification. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that someone's out there doing that stuff to the communities, but, but in terms of I guess that's just some for Carl that I want to share um, about about how then we the, the difficulty of then how how then we talk about um, because we're sort of being up defaulting to like there's like real Pacific studies and there's all those logy people that study the Pacific you know and, and 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 there is a difference but how do we tell that difference but also what are the logics on which we articulate that difference in ways that don't actually end up we don't paint ourselves into corners. Mm. What was the reference that was there? What was the reference? Yeah. Sorry? What was the reference to that critique? Did you say the Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's from. Um, it's from last year. Sorry. Um, you posted on the. <laughs> 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 if you Google the song. <laughs> 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 and I'm just joking. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
done it all, Wanihamo. Thank you to the organizers for including me on this panel. And I hope that this five minute recording will help inform, highlight issues and frame discussions. I wanna make six points. First, on the most basic but fundamental question, what is specific studies? Numerous scholars have attempted to provide definitions and most of this focus on one, geographical boundaries, two, the subject matter, and three, the interdisciplinary nature of specific studies. In terms of geography, the boundaries of what is specific and therefore within the purview of specific studies is subjective and malleable because it depends on who is defining the boundaries and the purpose for which it is defined. Consequently, specific studies could include or exclude West Papua, Timor-Leste and Rapa Nui. It could also include or exclude metropolitan countries with significant Pacific Islander populations. When we talk about Australia, how does that fit into this geographical imagining of the Pacific, especially for a country that sometimes imagines itself as part of the Pacific, other times as part of Southeast Asia or Europe? Similarly, Hawaii is in the Pacific, but also a state of the US. The questions worth engaging are, does geographical location influence the nature and substance of Pacific studies? Is Pacific studies more about how it is done rather than where it is done? What does the discipline of Pacific studies look like in its multiple and varied locations? As for subject matter, Pacific studies often focuses on the body of knowledge about Oceania and indigenous ways of knowing. Indigenous knowledge systems vary across the regions. Some are much more well known than others and therefore tend to dominate. Pacific studies should honor this diversity and avoid being homogenizing. The Pacific should be understood and experienced in its diversity. Pacific studies is usually described as interdisciplinary. But what exactly is that? Do we train ourselves and our students to be truly interdisciplinary? Or is it merely a mixture of theories, philosophies, and methodologies drawn from other disciplines? Is it much more helpful for Pacific Studies to draw the idea of being interdisciplinary and focus on creating its own theoretical and philosophical frameworks and methodologies? That way, it doesn't have to be inter anything because interdisciplinary implies an absence of disciplinary foundation. That leads to my second point, which is about Pacific Studies philosophical, theoretical, and methodological foundation. Teresia Tauba observes that, and I quote, Pacific Studies has not been more consistent in generating a literature that reflects on its practice, as well as its underlying theoretical or philosophical assumptions. I see this as a challenge to Pacific Studies scholars to develop clear and definitive theories, philosophies, and methodologies that set this discipline as distinct from others, rather than simply borrowing from them. There is nothing wrong with borrowing and learning from other disciplines, but we have to weave our own basket to carry what we borrow. Third, the empowerment rationale of Pacific Studies as proposed by Terence Wesley Smith. I have seen students being empowered by the realization that they can tell their stories and experiences in Pacific Studies program, while simultaneously fulfilling the academic rigor required by the university. While I agree with Terence that Pacific Studies should be empowering, I often wonder whether their should be more systematic framework that guides the empowerment process, which takes me back to the previous point about theoretical, philosophical, and methodological foundations. Without such foundation, we simply provide ourselves and our students intellectual markers and set off on a journey of self-discovery. There's nothing wrong with journeys of self-discovery. I often take such journeys myself until I discover I'm lost. There is a need for better navigational tools if Pacific Studies is to be truly empowering. Fourth, Diaspora and Pacific Islander Studies. I have alluded to this earlier. 
we need to think about how Pacific Islanders in the diaspora and those that are island or ocean based interact and influence Pacific studies. How does Pacific studies discipline embrace these diverse locations and experiences? Then there are the historically longer and equally important diaspora population, such as the South Sea Islanders in Australia, descendants of black birding. Are their experiences and stories part of Pacific studies? If yes, how does the discipline accommodate them? Fifth, Pacific studies online. The internet is increasingly becoming one of the arenas where Pacific Islanders interact, produce, reproduce, and exchange knowledge about Oceania. How does the influence knowledge about Pacific and the ways in which we engage with it? Is Pacific studies as a discipline prepared for this new arena of Pacific existence? And sixth, my final point, is on geopolitical competition in Pacific studies. Oceania has become a site for increasing geopolitical competition between the US and its allies on one hand and China on the other. There is therefore a rush to produce knowledge about and know the Pacific primarily for purposes of projecting geopolitical influence. How does Pacific studies help us understand these geopolitical competitions and their impacts on Pacific Islands and Islanders, and how the specific studies produce and project counter narratives. I have gone past my five minutes. I wish this panel a productive discussion and all of you a successful conference. Thank you.